All right, cool. Welcome back to the Run Through Trails podcast. Today we are recording episode number five, and we've got our first legitimate, professional, serious trail runner interview. We've got Tom Jolie joining us. Hi, Tom. Nice to have you. Hey, guys. Thanks very much for having me on the podcast. No worries at all. It's a pleasure. And obviously joined by our regular co-host, Lewis. How are you getting on, mate? I'm good. Uh, good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. It's uh, yeah, a Monday morning after the weekend. I'm feeling very tired, to be honest, fellas, as you will be, both be aware. But I seem to be getting roped into these longer runs as coach. So six hours for me yesterday on my feet. And that's a long time for a, what was a former middle distance runner. So yeah, a little bit tired this morning, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to this episode. Nice. Yeah, I know you've just been in the peaks with Gemma, haven't you? She's been uh, dragging you around a little bit. Were you doing the loose hill reps as well the day before or were you just coaching those? I was doing them, um, not very successfully, so I'm going to throw myself under the bus a little bit here. I was meant to do three reps. I build after two up and down just because I was feeling feeling it a little bit and one eye on that long run the day after and just knowing my history with those long runs. And I was playing route guide for Gemma, so I don't want to take any risks on not being able to do that long run. So I build at two reps. Gemma did four up and down, which um, two reps up and down was still... 550 meters worth of elevation in 35 minutes so it's still a fair whack up that loose hill it's a decent it's a decent climb as you know james because you've set a couple of um segment records on there already this year it just makes me feel good that you were obviously trying extra hard when we were doing the session together and then when you're just with jemmy you drop off after two so yeah <laughs> that says it all all right anyway let's let's get chatting to tom so um as i said really excited to have tom on the podcast me and tom met Firstly in Snowdonia, and then actually we both ran on Team GB at Euros recently in Annecy, um, and we got chatting there, and yeah, really glad to have him on the call. So, Tom, like we said beforehand, just want to kind of get to know a little bit about you as a person and then have a chat about, obviously, some of the big races you've had in the past and, and what your goals are um, coming up into 2024 and beyond. So, do you mind starting out by just giving us a little bit of background, like how you got into running, your childhood, where you're from, just so we can get a bit of context of who you are as a person? Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, actually, uh, when you mentioned, because we did uh, like three races in three weekends, didn't we? We did uh, Snowdonia, then a uh, little 20K up uh, Skidor, and then it was GB the next next weekend. Um, but my background uh, grew up in uh, East Anglia, um, sort of quite, uh, I suppose, like country upbringing, always out and about playing. Um, played a lot of sports at school um, and then went to university. Never really was like a serious runner. Just if there was like a team sport going, um, I would be getting stuck in at school or at uni. Um, so, and then after, I mean, after university, I kind of squandered my years at uni and realized, um, you know, real life was coming and I'd have to get a job and tidy up my life a bit. So I started trying to get fit through um, Ironman uh, and then I was planning on joining the army. So I was like, it could be the perfect sort of way to get fit uh, and then join the army. And that kind of led me down the path of as soon as I did um, the training, um, well, some training for the first Ironman. Uh, I kind of realized that's what I wanted to do. And so I kind of went into the army with that in mind, thinking I want to be a professional athlete of some kind. And I thought maybe triathlon would be um, the way to go. So I kind of focused on long course triathlon for a few years. Um, didn't do much when I was in the army because we just didn't have time um, to do the swim and bike, but obviously did a lot of running and carrying weight. Um, so kind of built up a lot of strength and endurance uh, in the four years there. Went, uh, did a few more Ironman, went to Kona, realized wasn't going to make the cut um, in terms of like the standard for pro triathlon now. It's just ridiculous. And had done one ultra with uh, a fellow officer when I was in and came like fifth at that race and wasn't really trying. It wasn't like a you know super competitive race, but I was just aiming to finish. So I kind of realized, ah, maybe this is probably the way to go. Kind of trail running was kind of, you know, becoming a bigger thing. Ultra running was becoming a bigger thing and um, sort of went into it more that way. Yeah. Yeah, cool. It was, so when you first had that thought of, all right, triathlon maybe isn't going to work out or, or at least isn't like the path of least resistance into this professional athlete thing and I'm going to go for trail running. 
what what was your exposure to that point? Had you like been aware of some of the bigger races? Did you were you following following the sport, or was it just that you took part in that event and enjoyed that type uh, of running? I mean, I kind of had a, a vague idea of like UTMB um, and some races. I suppose I didn't really understand like where the big races were, or like I guess Golden Trail was in its earlier days then. So I didn't even, you know understand distinguish between the sort of shorter and longer distances um obviously there was tom evans was in the welsh guards i was in the scots guards and so i was kind of aware of him his success at marathon Saab, and then um him leaving the army at around the same time so suddenly sort of got the impression and idea that um that it is like a, a potential career now and that you can like do big races and, and make a living potentially from it. Yeah, I just find it fascinating that point around Tom. Both Toms, uh, I mean, initially selected both of the Europeans this year. Um, thankfully for James, Tom Evans didn't go because it meant James stepped in, which was which was great. But yeah, it's a fascinating backstory, isn't it? That two uh, people with similar backgrounds in the army do find ultra running. I like the comparison you made, Tom, to getting used to running with that pack on your back and that heavy weight and probably being out for long times. And I do think um, recently I uh, crewed for Tom at Lavaredo and I was thinking all those hours out there, it must come in useful, like having spent a lot of time just out on your feet in that terrain and being more of an outdoorsy type of person. Yeah, this is like... I mean, I was in for four years and in that time just spent so much time where you're a lot of time on exercise and training where you're carrying the weight, but you're also not getting like good sleep or any rest or anything. Um, and so actually like the most tired I've ever been is not an ultra. It's back when we were in training and in Brecon and stuff um, where you're literally, you're going from one exercise into the next and you get to like, I know I can dig for about three days straight before I literally pass out on my feet. And then in terms of like patrolling, uh, I can go for about five, like you get to about day five and you just start reaching the point where you just start going lights out on your feet. Sometimes you just collapse. And sometimes like I had it one time where, uh, my knees locked out and I just fell asleep standing up in the middle of a patrol. Uh, and we ended up getting like the patrol ended up, uh, splitting. Um, so like yeah in terms of preparing you for like the long stuff um it's almost as if i've done like four years of uh ultra training before i even started ultra so when so when you did go into running how did you decide to tackle that did you immediately think right i need a coach i need to think about nutrition i need to do this that and the other or did you just think what are the biggest races next year let's get signed up and have a crack like what was the mindset there uh i yeah i never i've never had a coach uh although i am considering that maybe that's the last stone that i should probably start looking under um uh i was, I was like for the triathlon stuff was literally like you know kind of looking on youtube how do you swim um what's <laughs> trying to work out all the like aero hacks that you can on like bike forums and stuff um trying to do everything on a shoestring budget kind of thing um and so i kind of just i started with really terrible programming that i would write myself which was not advisable for anyone to follow it literally just progressive overload every day would just increase like the volume by 10 percent, and by the end of the month i'd be doing an iron man kind of thing um so i kind of learned as i've gone along the way um but yeah like i said i think maybe now i'm at a point where a coach might actually be useful it's um as a as a coach and as a owning a coaching company this is a marketing dream listening into this tom it's like how to swim how to do your first ultra i'm just like racking my brains with videos that we could do for people who are in your situation but i think it's absolutely incredible that you got are you still well you've got to where you've got to um self coach i think it's it's credit to to you and probably a lot of self discovery there going on and um working out and learning from your mistakes i imagine yeah exactly that i think you you like when you're self-coached you can do loads of stupid stuff and sometimes that works um because you can get you can get fitter faster than you may be in a more structured way with a coach but then equally like i'm starting to really notice now i'm training about a thousand hours a year but i think i'm just probably pushing that a little bit too hard 
Um, and so it's like all the sickness and injury and things that start to creep in. And it's the stuff like, uh, I've probably been overtraining a little bit early this year. And like a coach would probably spot that, you know, a month before you actually realize it yourself. Um, so yeah, good, good advertising for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a really good point and I hope you don't mind me jumping in here, James. I think a lot of people who are self coach would, um, be able to reflect on this in a, in a similar way. I think when people are self coach, they see often rapid improvements and they come from a lot of training and, Pretty much anybody who does start training, if they string that consistency back together, then they're going to see those big improvements. But I think one big difference a coach offers is that they always have, or, or mainly in my experience, a lot of coaches have the long-term athlete development in mind. So um, although you want to see big improvements and you could get big improvements from massive overload and, and specificity, that progression is so important. And um, at my, my first coach at university was, was always good. He's like, let's come up with a two year plan before we come up with the next two months. Um, and then once we got to that two years, it was always right. What's the next two years looking like? And that long-term plan then helped to develop the short-term processes, which I still use for, for coaching to this day. And I think you've hit the nail on the head, Tom, you can get caught up in that rapid improvement. And, and I heard Chris Jones say this, who I know is a member of your team as well out in Annecy is you feel like you can do everything and you want to do everything but you yeah. can't do everything all at once. You've got to be a little bit careful with it. Yeah, totally. I mean, well, Chris is, uh, he has a job as well. So he's actually, he's pretty careful, I think, with what he does. Uh, but I've definitely fallen for that trap of, yeah, trying to do everything. Yeah. I mean, that's a classic thing you hear as well when people go, generally it's people going from part-time athlete into being a full-time sponsored athlete where suddenly they're able to fund that lifestyle without having to work. And oftentimes those guys then overtrain and get injured and have issues and stuff because they've got all this time to use. Um, so I suppose, like you say, Chris is in the opposite position there. Same as me, where like there's barely enough time to get the training in, let alone overtrain. <laughs> so that's kind of like a nice little plus. Um, so what would, you, what would you say was your first big success, Tom? What was the first race that you went to and had a result where you felt like, right, I've arrived. I'm, this is legit. I'm, I can do this. Well, so that the first race I did was um, the Hadrian's Wall one where I came fifth. And then the next year I won, I actually like started doing proper training for it and won it. And that was like, I suppose it's like, it's funny because I hear this all the time. People, they win like some unheard of race and they suddenly think, oh, I'm now, I've got what it takes to go kind of to the top level. Um, so I was definitely fell into that category, but it's, it was enough like motivation for me to, for the belief um, to be real and strong enough. So that, although it wasn't a big race, it then led me to then enter into my first mountain ultra, uh, which was out here in Spain, where I came 16th. And then I was like, ah, okay. And it was, it was a really good field, this Ultra Sierra Nevada. Um, and it was part of the Spanish Cup. So, um, you know, we had like Miguel Harris and uh, Fotis Simapoulos and some other really good runners. And that was like a kind of, okay, Good result, but I had, uh, Zara Garcia, um, Spanish, very good runner, beat me. I was like, okay, I'm still getting beaten by women. There's still a way to go. But then again, the next year, when I then went full time, I then won the race out here. Um, so there's been little sort of stepping stone progressions and then going up to, um, I suppose, world champs last year. I did my first block at altitudes and was 11th there and like the the gaps were so so close it was like eight minutes to fourth place that was like the real moment of like you've been selected for gb and then also being you know eight minutes back from fourth and about 20 uh no 30 minutes back to first that's when it really became like okay in a 10 hour race 30 minutes is still a lot but 30 minutes is also still like a gap that give it a year or two like potentially you could be up there just for the listeners if they're not aware of that particular course what sort of distance and elevation are we looking at in innsbruck for the long course there yeah it was 85 kilometers with about 6400 meters of elevation so it's very very like much more of a mountain kind of race than a trail race um with the yeah, decent altitude going up to 2400 meters um and again like so good like first really competitive race um and you just like it changes the dynamic like when we were at europeans 
you know, we the standard is just everyone is on the same playing field. It's not like big gaps opening up. Everyone's in a tight pack. You look ahead of you, you've got three guys. You look behind you, you've got three guys on your shoulder. Um, and I guess it's that, that level of competition is what also, you know, makes you pick up your, your game. You suddenly realise, okay, I've won a few races here and there, but actually so is everyone else here. Everyone's at the same level. Yeah, it's funny that you start to look at like the start lists and look at people's results who are whatever seated in the top 10 in a race that you're in and everything's a win and you realize how many races there are and not all wins are made equal. Um, I mean, it feels nice to win, but it's all relative. Eh? Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that result of Worlds is, is massive. Where did you place in the team? Was that the same as Europeans where it's a team of four with three to score or what was the setup? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was the same. Um, except they, I think it was on time. Whereas at Europeans, they were doing places. Um, yeah. Oh, they did it on time. Okay, yeah. cool. Which was, because if with uh, the Americans and the French, the, um, the French won by five minutes, even though I think positionally, the Americans would have been higher. So if they'd used the position mm-hmm. system, it would have been a different result compared to the time. Yeah. Interesting way of doing it, isn't it? It's like, and how it makes a big difference, like that. You know, I, I play a little bit of golf. I was watching the golf over the weekend. It's like match play against stroke play and how somebody could win in one format but then lose in another. That's a really good example of how that might undertake. And I find that really tricky to when, you, when you're on the sidelines. When I was tracking you guys at Europeans, it was quite easy to track where you were as a team because you're just looking at the positions, doing a quick mental calculation and thinking, right, we know where they are and it's probably easy for team managers. But imagine trying to do that with time on the course and giving that feedback. Yeah to you as athletes that must be so tough yeah and they're fighting i mean it means you fight for every second so instead of being like oh well yeah. i've got sixth place or whatever i can take my foot off the gas you've got to fight like all the way to the finish so i think time is probably a better way of doing it um it's a good yeah it's a good point actually tom because i think that's a little bit like with the the point system in trail running as well that's a little bit different to like you know particularly road running or say uh, other sports where once you're out of the medals, you see people, some people just chuck it in and think, well, I'm out of the medals now. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm just going to take my foot off the gas. Whereas in trail and ultra, we know that those points can make a big difference and s- still every second can count, especially if you're trying to get onto uh, like an elite start list and you've got a, you're off the podium, but you know that your score could still get you on that elite start list. So yeah, I think like you say every point can count in a team race, but every second can count as well in that format. Which makes yeah. it yeah very interesting very interesting i i just got my elite car pass to utmb by three three points so yeah got to keep got to keep it up there we go that's, that's a really good example right there i mean james is in a similar boat i think about four or five seconds for you james in cullerman and um oh, well, hanging on to that was... podium but then Gemma, vice versa was on on the bubble literally did it by a point <laughs> oh really i, I still oh, you got the yeah. third automatic uh qualification for OCC. yeah 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 i got it through the podium the the points are terrifying like, i just can't understand them they seemingly what like was the don't what make was sense. Score? yeah um i think well, i can't remember exactly i think i needed 830 for the elite qualification for OCC, and i scored like eight eight three four or eight three six or something i would have i would have got through on points oh, at yeah. the same time yeah um but it, it, they are strange like we just went and did this race in Verbier, um, Lewis, Gemma, and Ben um, all ran the, the 25K at the Verbier San Bernard event, which was awesome. Amazing course, like really cool part of the world. But like the points just don't really make sense. I don't know if you've found that at all, Tom, with the UTMB stuff. Like it's re- so yeah. hard to predict based on your finish time and past results. Yeah. What score are you going to get? I don't get it. I, I do track the scoring and index systems quite a lot and do like... Uh probably too many too much stuff in a spreadsheet but um oh really yeah i think there's a bit of a there's a bit of a revision happening at the moment particularly on the utmb index where they're i think they've probably overscored in previous years and now all of a sudden you've got remy benet's and jim warmsley's and things and if they don't revise the scores down people potentially could start scoring you know towards that thousand mark and then <laughs> the system is broken interesting that's really interesting because in Verbier, Gemma 
Gemma was the perfect example because she'd run it two years in a row and she finished third two years in a row, but she was six minutes quicker this year than last year on on a tougher course because there was a lot of snow at the top and it was wet and she scored less points. She yes. Six minutes quicker and got yeah. less points on this ex exact same course in tougher conditions. It's mental. It was bad in the so Snowd Snowdonia 100k. Uh, friends ran 30 minutes quicker than the previous year and they scored... 30 points low or 40 points low like quite significant wow. yeah so there, there's definitely some adjustment going on yeah interesting yeah interesting, interesting. How, how much attention do you pay to the um itra index versus the utmb stuff uh the only, i mean the big one was actually the world's last year because uh itra were uh, on board as like part of the organization and scoring and UTMB obviously weren't involved. So there was like 30 points difference in my score between the two index systems. So Interesting. if there's any sort of political or like involved between the two systems, they obviously score it differently. Um, and then if there are other races where the scores are just exactly the same. So you, if originally they started off with the same algorithm when they used to work together, I guess they still have that same basic equation and then they just tweak it however it suits them um i mean that yeah that, that's the interesting thing here you can read up on the website the explanation as to how these things are measured but there's no transparency with transparency with like the actual formulas or the algorithms of how these indexes are created so i guess it does leave room for potential back-end manipulation i mean yeah. as a professional athlete and someone who this could actually affect your ability to make a living because you might not get a particular score to enter a race or i'm sure like potential um companies looking to sponsor athletes and stuff are using itra and utmb indexes as one of their metrics to gauge how good someone you, is um, you know i don't think they are good, no? um no i have well, started working with an agent um and which is really insightful because they know everyone and they feed back like how much other athletes are getting paid and also what these, like particularly the shoe brands are looking for. And uh, I mean, she, she, she was talking to Nike over the winter and the Asian and Nike was looking for someone who could finish on the podium at either Western States or at UTMB. And she also told me that one of the athletes they'd signed was for $25,000. So if they're looking for a sort of podium finisher at Western States or at UTMB for that kind of money or less, you know, I, I get the impression they don't quite understand the level of the sport. If, you know, imagine if you finished it on the podium at either of those races, you're probably looking upward of those kind of figures. So I, when it comes to the index, I think half of them aren't even aware of the scoring system and things like your social media following um is going to actually be a much much more important factor yeah i think i think it demonstrates a lot with the trail and ultra world still catching up like if you go to track and field and the agents in track and field and people who are sponsored they will know exactly what they're looking for what it means how much money is associated with that um but in the same way we're seeing like uh, I guess doping catching up as well with the, the testing being introduced at UTMB this year. And I'm sure you guys have already had your elite uh, emails come through about that being more of a, I guess, a bigger deal this year. And rightly so, it should be. But it feels like tr Trill and Ultra is growing rapidly and the sport is having to catch up. And a lot of these brands are jumping on board the, the Trail and Ultra scene and they're getting involved. I mean, Nike probably didn't even have a Trail and Ultra range like five or six years ago. And now like, you know, the ACG stuff is everywhere, but it also means that the people who act within that world, they probably need to bring themselves up to speed a little bit more because if you get a 25K retainer, um, a yearly retainer for finishing on the podium at Western States or UTMB. I mean, you'd get you'd get more as a bonus from a lot of the the trail and ultra running brands, let yeah. alone a retainer. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Yeah, at least it's good to see the prize money as well um, went up. Did you see that? Yeah, saw that. Yeah, yeah, and equal as well, which is great. Um, yeah. You know, it's just that the equality across the board, and yeah, that was that was really good. I saw that come through and. Um, it's more representative of what you would what you'd expect to see, isn't it? Yeah, 
and um, a friend sent me a PTRA uh, spreadsheet the other day. It has all the big money races on. So there's like, uh, I think it's about over a 10 page document it lists all the races with prize money, which is quite interesting to look at. But there's a big disparity, like UTMB, I think, is now is now the highest prize money race. Um, oh, actually, there's Comrades. Comrades is the highest. Oh, really? Interesting. I, I know that not long ago, it was, I think Run Rabbit Run was the highest paying ultra distance trail event when UTMB, before they upped their prices. And it's something that had been talked about quite a lot. Um, but that's cool that the PTRA are looking to put that stuff together and kind of support professional athletes that way. I know we've reached out to them and hopefully we can kind of get a bit of a dialogue going around the events that we're looking to establish in Europe and just get some feedback on what it is that they want to see and what it is that professional runners want in terms of the development of the sport from an event organizer point of view whether that's exposure or prize money or appearance fees or live streams or you know i know it's all of the above but kind of you know what these guys want to see and what's going to entice them to be part of these events because right now it yeah. kind of does feel sorry mate like the utmb events obviously dominate the scene with the exposure obviously western states enormous um and everything else is like kind of a, a tier below do you think they're going to come in and for you, like organizing events, will they have like some sort of regulations and things that you would uh, work towards so that you could say, ah, oh, you know, run through events or PTRA approved or, or whatever? I'd love that. I literally reached out to them and just said, we want to hear what you guys want and we want to work together to develop events that promote um, professionalism in the sport and, and get good runners to our events and allow the best runners in the world to come and compete and earn earn a fair amount. So yeah, we'd be more than happy to collaborate on that type of stuff. I think that's the way it needs to go, really, doesn't it? You've always got to have a little bit of collaboration between the organizations and the associations and the athletes themselves, because without the athletes, if we're being completely honest, like the spectator side of the sport just doesn't really exist. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm, I'm interested to get your thoughts, Tom, on how you pick your races with all this in mind because you're you're trying to be a professional athlete so money has to come into the in into the like decision making process as it would with any athlete across any sport um but with again if i, if I relate it back to track and field or marathon like road running in particular um people are paid not just to get prize money or, or when they get prize money they're paid in appearance fees and they're also paid to go to these races so their their flights are covered their accommodations covered and that isn't something that I see very commonly in the ultra and trail world. So I think that probably needs to catch up as well to make it more professional. Um, so what factors are you considering when you're picking your races? Because you said with your planning, uh, at one point it was a bit ad hoc. I imagine it's a lot different now and that must play some part in it. Yeah, it's interesting. I was thinking about this because first year I went full time. Uh, I was like very much like I need to make money straight away from the sport. Otherwise I'm not even semi pro. Uh, I'm just, you know, wasting time. And so I, uh, I focused quite a lot on like, I was looking at all the prize money races. Um, and the big one I did actually was the ultra X world championships where they originally were going to put up 50 grand total prize purse for across, um, male and female across the podium. A few weeks out, I think they didn't get as many pros and big names as they liked. So they, they halved the prize purse, but it was still a total of 25 grand. So I ended up winning over 8,000 quid for a week's worth of racing. And I was like, God, easy money. Like if I can do one of these every, you know, couple of months, then I'll be making a living just off the winnings. Uh, and actually two weeks after that, I then. I saw it was a uh, Kong Lakes Ultra in Keswick. And uh, so I went, traveled from back from Spain to the UK and there was 800 quid prize purse for that. And I ended up winning that. So in about the space of one month, I uh, made about nine grand in prize money. Um, but I haven't, I haven't won a single penny since then. That was two years ago now. Um, and I think the danger is actually not to chase races with prize purses because it's just like a slippery slope like yeah great you might win some but the reality is it's not sustainable like even with increasing prize purses you know you might be talking two three grand uh for winning 
a fairly big race and that that could be like 100k or 100 miler it's like you can't do that every month and then plus you got all the you know expenses and whatever else that come out of that so now i kind of switched the mindset and last year was the first time i did utmb and really got a sense that no other race really matters in comparison you could win five other small races but a good performance at utmb is the difference between picking up a major contract um or or not like like i won my first utmb series race last year in transantau in hong kong and i thought i won by like an hour and i was like this is it this is going to get me you know something big and nothing really came of it because actually even though there's some other good guys running there like no one's actually watching that race everyone's only really really cares about the really big finals and things um so yeah, in, in answer, I suppose that's my planning process now is like thinking about where I can maximize like a good performance and, and how that would affect um, a career. Yeah, so that brings me on to actually a question that I was going to ask before, Tom, because I know that we, we touched on this briefly in Annecy. Um, and we're like, we're going to talk about this year's racing. <laughs> and I am looking at a few of your recent results that we just want to chat through briefly. But before we do, World Champs 2025, um sort of sits quite soon after utmb and i know it's something that a few of the guys were chatting about um in annecy and that that decision between do you want to make a world team again have another like stellar result for your country and kind of represent gb and go and do the do the team thing or do you prioritize the fact that like you've just said utmb is the race um and how do you choose between the two because it seems very unlikely that you're going to have a standout performance at UTMB in a hundred miler and then three weeks later pop up on the GB team and have another good performance. Like where's your head at with that sort of stuff? Yeah. Did you see they released the uh, selection policy for worlds? For next yeah. Year? Um, and I, I immediately went through with a, a fine comb and saw the, uh, there'd be no, you can't do any racing four weeks before worlds. Um, yeah. And we, for, for context there was a bit of confusion or like a bit of a discussion with europeans as to what would be acceptable to race in the time frame before europeans um which was a little bit controversial i won't go into any more detail but so i looked at the world selection policy and it's already said four weeks uh went online counted the days between ccc occ utmb etc and the date the long course race would likely be on the Saturday uh, towards the end of September 2025. And I saw actually there's 29 days and 30 days uh, between the races. <laughs> so I emailed Angela back and said, uh, by the way, this means, is this okay for me to do CCC then and do Worlds as a double? And she went, no, you can do OCC. That's fine. You can't do CCC. And then she actually subsequently revised the selection policy so that instead of saying <laughs> four weeks it said 30 days um yeah. so there we go just making sure there's no no confusion for next year but yeah i don't know yeah i suppose a lot will depend on how this year goes um i think if i had a really good result this year at utmb then i would want to focus more on worlds next year and maybe do occ if i can qualify as like a double because a 55k into an 80k with four weeks apart would actually work really nicely um but if if UCMB doesn't go so well this year then I probably want to have another crack at it next year and focus on it and potentially there's going to be a split with international athletes having to decide between CCC and UTMB or doing the world's long course because realistically, you're not not going to be able to do both. Um, have you have you got your your eye on Worlds next year? Do you think? I'd like to. I had an amazing time in Annecy, um, but again, it really depends how OCC goes this year. Me and Lewis have already looked at a loose plan for next year because there are other races that I'd love to do that are not in the UTMB sort of ecosystem anyway. Um, so spoilt for choice races wise. So yeah, uh, you know. Marathon de Mont Blanc's one that we've looked at and um, 
and then linking that into potentially going to Worlds would be, yeah, would be amazing. So I'll definitely be putting my name in the hat for it. Yeah, I think it's it's one of those, isn't it? When we were touching on, why, I guess, why do you race? What are you in it for? And and that prize money and back to that point and put my coach's hat on here. It's it's looking at what you want from the sport, isn't it? And making those decisions around why are you in it and, and why are you racing? And I know some people in, in the running world, they, they have to make a living and that's going to play a big part in the races that they go and do. And that's why they'll race regularly as well. And they'll literally travel the world out of a suitcase to go and do that. Um, but from my perspective, I think to get the best out of yourself and you touched on this, Tom, I think you've got to be selective and you've also got to play to your strengths. Um, you've got to figure out which which of those races are right for you. And I'm just a big believer that if you do everything right and you get the best out of yourself and you maximize your ability, then the money will will follow. Um, and if the money if the money doesn't follow, you'll you'll have a lot of fun doing it anyway, and you'll meet a lot of people and you'll go and race you where you want to where you want to race, and you'll you'll still get the best out of yourself. And whether that's UTMB, which I know you're going back to this year, Tom. Uh, whether it's performing well there, which is where the, all the sponsors are going to look. Of course they are. Um, you know, I've had that conversation with numerous athletes this year, in particular the Hawker athletes who are saying there was a lot of pressure on them to run UTMB because that's what the Hawker team want to see. Um, and pretty much every brand is going to say that to every athlete because it's where the world's eyes are. Um, so there's going to be a lot of pressure on that. But as you allude to, James, there's a lot of races out there that probably suit you better as an athlete. And I'm sure it's the same for you, Tom. Like there's probably races out there that you look at and you think, but I know I can do well there because that suits me. But is it going to get you the, the sponsorship deals? It's, it's so tricky as an athlete. You've got to go through all these questions and get those answers and then come up with an edu educated decision on, on where you race. Um, flipping it back to UTMB last year, Tom, because I was tracking you and obviously you were first Brit there last year, again, tracking the two Toms within that race. Um, and it was only then I picked up on the fact I was like, oh, this British guy, Tom Jolie, but doesn't really live in Britain. I didn't really see much of him in, in Britain beforehand. I know you do a lot of your training and preparation elsewhere. And currently, I think you're in, in Spain and then you're, you're heading to teens next as well. So very much yeah. traveling around and living that life. But you're not based here in the UK. Is that right? Yeah, no, that's correct. I, I moved out to Spain uh, almost three years ago now. Um, and in order to train full time, like, the cost of living here is half of that of the UK. Um, so, and the weather nice. obviously is pretty good. So it's nice. Well, you've got better weather than us. James has uh, been training in rubbish weather recently. Um, but yeah, I can see why you'd make that move for sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I keep, I keep dreaming about uh, as soon as you move one place, then you want to move to another place. No, uh, James is talking about moving to Annecy full time as well. And then having been there, I can see why it's pretty, pretty dreamy. Yeah, man. I mean, there's there's just no shortage of of amazing places to be, and as good as the the trails in Surrey are, just can't quite get that elevation. Like, definitely jealous of your Strava. Sometimes opening it up yesterday, just knocking out fifty k with three thousand meters of climbing or whatever out the back door. I mean, <laughs> although Lewis, you've been out to the peaks, getting a couple of thousand meters of climbing over a few hours of running, so it is there to be had. It's just not. It's those long, sustained climbs, which I suppose leading into UTMB are going to play a huge part of your training, Tom. Yeah, for sure. And like I, I noticed yesterday on that run, like uh, when I get to about 3,000 meters, uh, the elevation's like 35% average gradient on a kilometre. Um, and you just can't get, obviously, the altitude or like doing two kilometres at a consistent gradient in the UK. Um, so I've got a friend who's doing, he's got obsessed with Skidor reps. So I think he did four reps of Skidor the other day in order to get like yeah. close to 4,000 meters of elevation. Yeah. I mean, you got to do what you got to do. It's either that or you're on a treadmill. I, I mean, my treadmill downstairs has now got wood wedged under it so that the gradient's steeper than it's designed to do. <laughs> um, and just doing like long treadmill reps is, it's, it's brutal, but I mean, is what it is isn't it? It, it it's cool that you're out there and you've got access to that sort of terrain to train and i imagine not only the altitude but the heat acclimatization is going to make a big difference to your fitness as well like you just mentioned before we started recording that it's like 40 degrees where you're living at the moment what what elevation are you living at uh, i live at 700 meters which is 
it works actually quite nicely because like in the winter it's quite cold so you can cycle down to the coast or um go down in the summer like obviously you can go up high and try and escape the heat a bit um but yeah for it's been july and august is is pretty tough um and you do get a benefit like there's a lot of heat training benefit but i've been back in spain for six weeks and i'm now just like totally cooked like i'm knackered because you just don't sleep well um and like i said it's like 30 degrees at night so literally you don't get any respite from the heat um so yeah i'm looking forward to going to teen next i've seen like the weather's probably about half the half the temperature yeah what, what's the format for teen what's the plan have you just booked your own place you're going out there solo are you meeting up with anybody to do any training uh yeah i was going out solo um but then a mate was going to font remo uh can't he can't do that so he's going to come join me instead which would be good uh and then i know like josh wade uh tom evans all the brits like are going to be out in teen uh prepping along with some of the kiwis and like i think it's getting more and more popular each year so it's going to be should be a good um well we're gonna do a full 30 days a full month basically at altitude um so i suppose the trick will be not to do too much rather than uh training the house down because yeah four weeks at altitude is, is quite a lot yeah it's a good good stint as well though isn't it tom it's a bit it's kind of that in that bracket the right amount of time you'd want to spend at altitude we have this conversation a lot um james and i about the altitude sort of camps and again very different to what you tend to see with marathon runners track runners is that a lot of people spend time at altitude to come back and compete at sea level so the whole concept of train high um and, and well sort of live high train low even or, or live high train a little bit lower in this sense in teens it's train high and live high um yeah. but the biggest difference here is that you're actually going to compete at altitude which i think is uh, is quite significant because a lot of people have to get that altitude strategy right when they drop back down to sea level because it's so different. But with you guys, as you mentioned, Tom's out there, Josh is out there. I've seen Ronnie Spark is out there and uh, everyone seems to be preparing in teens this year. And I, I imagine everyone's mind is that the climbs are so high at UTMB and CCC in particular that you need to get up high to condition yourself. Because if you live in Chamonix, it's quite difficult, isn't it, to go and get those climbs. You probably have to stay in refuges and places like that. Yeah, I, uh, I went to Chamonix last year, um, the build-up, and yeah, it's not the same. Um, but I've been to team before. Uh, I actually I did quite a lot of Nordic skiing when I was in the army, and we uh, we went to team for three weeks before Christmas, and that was the first time been exposed to altitude. So we were sleeping at at the lake, which is like two thousand one hundred. But then we were we were driving to Val d'Isère each day and getting a bubble up and i think it's called la colette there's a little uh frozen lake which they pieced it like put in um nordic ski tracks around that was at 2700 meters so we were training at 27 every day and sleeping at wow. 21 and then went back to the uk for christmas and oh it's just insane it was like that first time you get that benefit of a of an altitude block and like literally you'll be running at home and testing like how long I could hold my breath while still running and you kind of realize like your lungs are not the limiting factor when you do that kind of altitude block um you know you've just got you've got more than enough oxygen it's just can the heart and like the rest of the body keep up kind of thing that is high that is yeah. really high and when you get home that's uh and you go back to running around little forests and roads here in the UK they'll feel like speed bumps <laughs> to be yeah. on those climbs altitude <laughs> yeah yeah doing and particularly when you're a novice and you're quite inefficient with like using the poles and stuff nordic skiing two two seven really uh yeah it takes it out of you yeah yeah so in addition to the teen training camp tom you said last year before UTMB you went out to sham obviously specific is always good and you can get on the actual trails but it's not quite got that same elevation so you're going to be out in teen higher elevation with some good guys to get out training with you had a Obviously, incredible result last year, like Lucy just said, first Brit, 16th overall in UTMB, which is massive. Like, I know for some people, 16th might not sound like an amazing placing, but as we talked about, it's the deepest race you could possibly be in in the world. 
um, after an 11th place finish at World. And I'm assuming, well, it seems pretty obvious you're going to want to improve on that 16th place. So what did you learn from that race and, and what else have you done this year and are you going to do differently for UTMB in 2024 um, to probably try and try and breach that top 10 or what, what are you looking at? Yeah, no, I was, thank you. I was, I was uh, really happy actually with 16th because you look at the guys ahead of you um, and I know I had like a really good performance with the fitness I had. I just obviously wanted to be fitter. Um, so this year I, I've set myself quite a lofty goal because 16, 22 hours, 25 minutes last year, which, you know, as recently as 2016 would have got me second place. So obviously just like the sport has moved on so much in that time. And so rather than thinking about positions now, I'm thinking in terms of like progressing that time, assuming you have the same weather. So generally I always find when you race a race the second time, um, typically I always think you can improve by about 5% just with the knowledge of like where, like how the course and how the race like plays out where you actually need to burn matches and where you need to save them. Um, combined with a bit of altitude uh, training this year, which I didn't do last year. Um, and I've been quite nerdy on the analysis of the splits, which I won't give the exact percentages, but uh, it was fascinating. There was a really clear trend between the top 20, and I, I just did the top 20 overall, so it was all the men, um, and the top 10. And you can see as a percentage of their time to the four major, let's say, quarters of the race, Le Contamine, Cormayeur, and Champagne Lac, that the guys who are running one to 10, typically overall, that time to um, Le Contamine is relatively slower as part of their overall time, which kind of tells you they're actually just going easier. And uh, you can really see it, particularly with Jim, who just ran a ridiculous last quarter of the race. Like it was about 26% of his total time compared to everyone else's where it's about 29%. So literally he's he's holding something back this year probably for the first time. But it shows like if you want I can kind of see the averages and like what the best kind of strategy is. But typically the top ten are all going much easier in the first half compared to the top twenty. Um and like the rate of blow ups is just insane because what I'm not seeing is like all the people who didn't finish. So in amongst yeah. that, you know, there's loads of guys who aren't finishing. Um and like I was in about 40th position at Le Contamine and I'm in 16th by the finish. So actually those early checkpoints, it really doesn't matter so much, you know, as long as you're racing your own race, I think it makes a huge difference to your performance overall and, and not getting caught up in the racing, which is easier said than done when you're like running with all these big name athletes. And it's just like, you know, you get you get carried away and you don't even realise on the first climb that you're at threshold. You know, I think my heart rate was 173 or something going up uh, the first climb. Uh, wow. And you think you're going easy because you're talking and breathing through your nose or whatever, but you, you're really not. Um, so, yeah, my target time this year is, is 21 hours, uh, which in theory should be good enough for a top 10. Um, and I've got pretty define splits then based on like those percentages uh as to how that will break down but uh yeah we'll have to have to see on the day it's easier said than done like running like for example i want to run six hours 18 between le contamine and cormayeur which is probably the the hardest most technical part of the race and it's and it's at night so it's easy on paper but we'll see on the day James and I have analysed many a split from the UTMB race, CCC, to OCC. And as a coach, I sit there every year screaming at the TV, screaming at the live stream, why are you going so hard? Why is everyone going so hard? And it's never, I've never understood it. Um, I think the commentators also uh, give off this like false sense of security around it's good to go hard and, you know, oh, yeah, they're gunning it. This is amazing. And it almost entices people to do that. And I sat uh, actually over the weekend again, analyzing the OCC splits. And the first climb is by far the hardest. 
um, as in like the fastest of the race and they slow down significantly. And I was looking at a, a lady who went from like 198th in the women's race and got herself all the way down into, I think, 102nd. So she passed like 96 people in the race and her, cl her last climb was still slower than her first climb, but her first climb was relatively one of the slowest in, you know, compared to those who were competing against her was very, very slow. And my strategy for James was like, okay, James, you probably need to be like third or fourth woman going up that first climb because I've looked at the splits and that's right. We, we use a rate that James, um, kind of brought into our coaching world called Munter rate. And we, we use that to calculate the, the elevation, uh, as well as the distance. And that gives us a rate of travel. And I can see from that rate that the rate significantly drops off for the people who go backwards through the field. And as you say, Tom, that doesn't even pick out the people who've decided to step off as well. So the average is scary in terms of how much people slow down. Now, I know there's an element of slowing down because it's an ultra. So you're going to have that because your fueling can't keep up. And we know that. Uh, and that's fine. But that is an excuse, like you say, to go absolutely mental up the first climb um, and start taking that energy out of your legs so that when the tough climbs come, there's actually nothing there. And that's the big thing for me. If there's nothing in the tank to, to navigate these tough sections with, then you're always going to be in trouble. And I know James has experienced that on both sides of the coin now, but I do think strategy plays a huge part. And that's, I'm, I'm actually sat here like smiling at that that learning from you, Tom, because I think that for me, it's like, that is the golden nugget. And I don't think people have mastered it yet. I really don't. Yeah. I think it's so easy as well, though. Uh, like we were saying earlier, at the big competitions, everyone there is a winner. Everyone there is a champion and gives like 100% and like they're used to winning and being in the front pack. And the problem is, it's like so rare do you get all of those people in one race. And so unless you've experienced it and done a lot of high level competitions, you're just not going to have that experience. Um, and so people just get, like I say, you just get caught up in the racing rather than like the strategy. Yeah. I yeah, think it, one of the it, big it, examples for me from last year was CCC John Alban was like, we sat there and watched it and he was like nine minutes back at one point. And he just said, I'm sticking to my plan. I'm sticking to my plan. And I think you've hit the nail on the head. I'm sure James is going to jump in and say the same thing there. It's, it's so easy to get carried away, but you've got to be so brave and believe in your strategy so much and just take yourself out of that race almost. Uh, I, was, I was saying I sent the same strategy to a mate. And uh, when uh, I actually worked out the percentages and then looked at our times, my split to Lecontamine is actually a good enough split for 21 hour pace. So I was running 21 hour pace last year. I just didn't know it and my mate was running 22 hour pace last year and he didn't know it and like he had a really tough time and i probably only just managed to hold it together but like until like you guys have obviously given it a lot of thought with the uh what do you call it the munter race um yeah yeah but like i think a lot of people will start doing that now as well like the data is starting you know is there the numbers are there people can work out what's the optimal kind of rate of decline as it were so like yeah you want to be a little bit too fast maybe on the first climb because you know you're going to slow down but it's like by how much of that percentage yeah yeah totally we we looked specifically at, um antonio martino Mar martinez perez i might have got him he slightly wrong there at OTC. oh man the best yeah most even splits you could ever see in that type of race like he just romped through the field he was so far back at yeah. the start it's, it's yeah. fully just a confidence thing man i've had it in races before where it is horrible to let like three groups go in front of you when you genuinely think you're there to compete for a podium but at the end of the day like like you said you've, you've worked out your timings it's exactly what we do all you can do is run your race and with it with a race like this you know that there's an upper limit to what you're going to be able to do so even if you have quite conservative timings for the first half of the race there's no way you finish that race thinking oh i've left a load in the bank there i could have gone harder it's not going to happen because if you've still got 50 miles to, <laughs> to put it all out there in the second half there's no shortage of running left even for me we're looking at the Argentia aid station which comes at like 42k into 53 You've still got a massive climb and a big long descent back into town. There's a lot of running left there. Like there's a lot of ground to make up. 
um, and and feeling semi decent at that point, well fueled and with a little bit of something left in your legs, it is going, you're gonna you're gonna catch people. So it's just being confident to to stick to the plan, really. How does your uh, ego feel when you're getting passed by first, second, third woman? Do you do you feel a little twinge and start pushing a little bit harder? It's a good question. I would say I. I'm well speaking for myself I would say I'm pretty good at that because I've come from just zero level of competition I've very like kind of low expectations I don't really have a name no one really cares so it's not there's no spotlight on me there's no pressure that being said when I did the uphill trial at Skidor and I came like fourth female um yeah it doesn't feel good <laughs> only because I know that in those types of races I I should be up there with like the best woman in the world, if not ahead. Um, and it, like you mentioned before, it does give you a good gauge because like the top women in these races now are ridiculous. I look at my UTMB index score versus like your Maud Mathis and Sophia Luckley and, and those type of characters. And like we're in a similar world. So I can kind of pace off and look at when they run a good race. And statistically speaking, a lot of women are a bit less ego driven. And this is obviously speaking totally in generalizations because it goes both ways. But looking at like Tony McCann's race at OCC last year, she ran it really well, really evenly and ran a belter of a time. So, yeah, it's, it's just it's interesting to analyze all that stuff. And I think we we think about that in, in, in quite a similar way. And there's one thing that I want to touch on before we end, because I feel like from the short period that I've gotten to know you, know you Tom, um, we can't have a have an interview with you and not ask you about shoes. Seem to be pretty obsessed with shoes and gear and like testing out lots of different shoes. I know you're really keen chatting to people in Annecy about the, the new prototypes and like grabbing Benedict and like, oh, what's that ASIC shoe and how does this one feel? I see you're testing a lot of shoes on Strava. So come on, mate, what, what's the best shoe of the moment? What are you going to use for UTMB? What should I be using for OCC? Give us the uh, inside well, scoop. So here's, here's my conclusion, which is like the coach answer is uh, use the shoe that you think like it works best for you, which sounds really obvious. But the, I got sent some ASIC shoes, Fuji Speed 2s last year, the week before UTMB. And I was like, I absolutely love these shoes. Got them six days before the race, never worn them ASICs before. Ended up running UTMB, didn't change the shoes, didn't change socks, no issues whatsoever. Um, and it kind of opened my eyes because so I didn't know you could get like shoes which have good grip, have a carbon plate, have good foam and all the rest. So then I was like, there must be other even better shoes out there. So the last year I bought like all the top, you know, trail super shoes, testing them out and stuff. And the funny thing is, is like they all had various, like I didn't get on as well with those shoes as the ones, the ASICs ones, which I originally liked. And I've gone full circle. So a year later, I'm now actually going back to the same model of shoe that I was using last year. Um, so I think it, yeah, it really, it just depends. They're all different shapes and, you know, I'm sure you have like a shoe that you find, you know, works for you. It doesn't work for other people. Um, so yeah, at the moment, the Fuji Speed 2 is my, it's going to be my go-to ratio. Uh, I have got some prototypes coming from Kip Run, um, which I'm quite excited to try out um they're sort of stepping up uh their trail shoe range quite a bit so so we'll see maybe there'll be a last minute change i'm not sure yeah it's, it's a tricky one because i've got shoes that i love but they're not super foam or plated so it's like it will go with the shoe that i know i like i know it works for me i feel good in it it's nice and lightweight it's the salomon s lab pulsars that i wore in annecy i know they work for the distance i know they're a bit more on the minimal side but then Lewis's partner, Gemma, who I do a lot of training with and stuff, we've obviously had Gemma on the podcast before, has been running in the, uh, in the new Adidas. Um, obviously, they're not carbon, but like, you know, with the, with the plastic rods and the super foam, um, and she really likes them. And I, a little part of me knows that I'm losing a bit of efficiency and my legs are getting a bit more battered, but I like the shoe. So I'm torn at the moment. I've just ordered a pair. I'm going to do a few test runs and, and see how they feel. I know you raced in those in Snowdonia, right? And they didn't really work for you uh the new terex ones yeah yeah i mean they're the foam like it's exactly what i was saying like they've got the best super foam like that it's so bouncy and energy returning but the shape of the shoe is bizarre and i know like a lot of their athletes you can see it having problems like petter 
changed out of those shoes during Western States into the other pair. And I know Robbie Simpson uh, prefers the the more mediocre um, pair without the plate in. So, and I've heard a number of other people have, have similar problems with like the upper and things. So it's probably, and I think that's a good example, actually, the same with the Nike Ultrafly. Like that shoe has been tested by Nike athletes and it's been built around their feet or what they want. And probably the same with Terex shoe has probably been built around Tom um, and like what he wants out of a shoe, not necessarily for, you know, your bog standard average runner with like wide feet or super narrow feet or or whatever. So actually going for, let's say, a, a signature shoe is probably like quite a big risk because it hasn't been designed with you in mind. It's been designed for like the top, top runners. That's a really good point. I, I'm i a hawker man myself. Um, I like the Tectons. I really like them. I think they have that cushioning, a little bit of carbon in there as well. But it's funny you say that, Tom, because yesterday in the peaks, Gemma was saying the shape of the shoe when she was trying to get her feet down, particularly on technical ground, um, like the shoe didn't fit in, in the placements which is really interesting because they are quite chunky at the front. And um, Gemma has quite, quite big feet for a girl, like seven, seven and a half. So she found that that quite tricky, whereas I found the the, te the Tectons are a little bit narrower uh, and, and allow me to get it down. What she did do, though, with those Adidas, it must be said, is she sent them off to the to the peaks to a cobbler and she got the Vibram grip on the bottom of them. Felt like she needed that a little bit more tread. Yeah, she got yeah. five mil um, yeah. Vibram light base put on them. It's pretty cool. That is quite cool. I was thinking about doing that with some shoes. The problem I found is just so narrow in the midfoot. Like you say, it's like super wide in the, in the toe box. And then it's, it's like, it's not a foot shape though. Like no one's foot is that shape. So I think that that's the issue. No, that's, that's what we're seeing. And um, it, it's, I think there's some elements of saving the quads, you know, that cushioning mm -hmm. does help. Um, and we've, we've compared it funnily enough on the treadmill. So We've done similar sessions in one shoe compared to that shoe on the treadmill, and we see uh, an improvement in speed and a reduction in heart rate. So the shoe clearly does give you a response. Uh, like, it has you doing, to. Uh, can you see like efficiency, like changes? Like, are they wearing a mask and stuff? Uh, no, we, we've not measured it with a mask. We've just purely used our own metrics on it. So yeah, we've not done it in the lab yet. I'd be interested to see it in the lab. I know a lot of people have done that again with the shoes for, for the roads and triathletes. Alex, yeah. you did it here in Loughborough to find out the best shoe. I think there's, it, Trail and Ultra is getting to that stage, which is mad, isn't it? It's like, yeah. it's crazy. I yeah. mean, you look at where triathlon's gone. I always use triathlon as a as a model. I like, you know, it's, for, it's Formula One now, like the amount of testing and and science that goes into it. And Trail is, is sort of, it's trying to follow. It's going that way, isn't it? 100%. Like, I think the biggest, for me, the the biggest kind of, revelations over the last couple of years have been one the the fueling so how the, the high carb strategy which we've obviously nicked from cycling um and then the heat heat mitigation strategies within the race as well as heat acclimation and heat acclimatization those two areas have been big and we've seen big improvements i think the third is the technology now the shoes the lightweight ev everything everything that's going into it so I think there's a lot more to come. I think we're only scratching the surface. So it's exciting. But as you've quite rightly said about UTMB, Tom, those times that would have been sort of top two or three in the past are now getting your top 20. And it was a, a, apparent at Western States recently. Like those oh, times yeah. were absolutely insane. Yeah. Like they I were think insane. The, big, the big thing there is the ice. Like everyone's just wearing ice vests now. So like the heat now isn't isn't as much of a of an issue. It's like you just can't, you're just taking out all those variables more and more now. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, no, it's definitely exciting times, exciting time to be a professional athlete in this space with just all the opportunity that's opening up. And it feels like so much increased exposure as well. Um, to me, trail running is one of those sports that I was always a fan when I was a kid of like ski movies and snowboarding and mountain biking because they were just aesthetically kind of cool to watch. And I just found that that type of content captured people's attention in the 90s, early 2000s, because it just looked spectacular. And I really think Trowin has got that same thing about it. I know running isn't as cool as jumping off an 80 foot cliff on skis, but you're doing it in kind of the same places. And some of these drone shots and some of the live streams now are getting to the point where just aesthetically it's enjoyable to watch. And I, I think 
if we can kind of, you know, the way that a lot of companies and a lot of brands are able to translate that into social media, we are going to start to grab the attention of people who maybe don't want to sit down and watch a road marathon or a track 10K because like it's hard, even for us as fans of the sport, it can be a little bit brutal, but watching, yeah, yeah, watching trail racing chopped up into a digestible form in these stunning locations, it's just so marketable. Um, it's so yeah, marketable. I don't know. It's blowing up. Yeah. You're going to be, uh, you're going to be all over the camera. If you're with the, uh, lead females, you'll get loads of camera time. I always make it because <laughs> I normally have Courtney like breathing down my neck at every race I've run against her. So often people go, Oh, I saw you on the camera. So in the camera, she always has a, has a run of it. Of course, well, we what? watched you in um, Trans Grand Canaria when you were with Courtney, where James and I were out there, and um, you were running with her there, and we were tracking you, and like, oh, yeah, he's with Courtney. <laughs> yeah, oh, she, just, she just doesn't stop. It's just, I had her behind me on uh, UTMB going up Grand Col Foray, and you're like, how are you still there? Like, I'm not going slow. I'm not going easy. And she just <laughs> thought, she, like, she haunts my dreams. She haunts my dreams. <laughs> Keeps you honest. Keeps you honest. Yeah, oh, nice. All right, then, mate. Amazing. Well, thanks again for your time. It's been really nice to have a chat. I mean, we might even cross paths in France if you're there for a month. I'm out a few times over the next few weeks, so I'll um I'll definitely give you a shout. But if not, when are you yeah, yeah. heading out to Sham ahead of UTMB? Uh, so I'm gonna uh, Wednesday. I'm gonna drive out to Sham on Wednesday. I actually want to do the first 82k in one go on Friday because I've seen a lot of the French guys do that um when they recce the course and actually it just gives you such a good feel because Cormier is a good like point where everyone who's gone too hard is just like lying on the floor um it's the first sort of carnage spot and actually you know you need to get there and still have you know good sensations so that's the plan and then I'll be in team uh at the weekend all the way until race week uh, and then I'll be back in Chamonix yeah awesome well, maybe we'll catch up. Well, maybe not before the race, but after the race. We'll be in Chamonix for about, well, a good five days after UTMB yeah. weekend. We'll be out on the course supporting. We'll definitely see you out there. I know Lewis is going to be driving yeah, around cool. trying to take it as much as he can. Um, yeah, no, I'll definitely so, yeah. Uh, I'll be watching you as well on, on OCC. Um, yeah, Sweet. looking forward to it. Cool. All right, then, mate. Well, lovely to chat. Yeah. Good luck with everything. Nice Hope you, the though. training camp goes well. And, uh, yeah, we'll definitely cross paths in Chamonix in a, what are we talking now? Six weeks' time? It's getting scarily close. Yeah. Getting close. Looking forward to it. Great. Thanks, totally. guys. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for that. Cheers, James.